and welcome to Bletchley Park. I'm Emma. And I'm Simon, and here we are at the home of computerised hacking. We will be your guides as we delve into the world of computer hackers, their history and events. We're going to look at how hacking has impacted the modern world. When you think of a hacker, what do you imagine? Do you think that charming young lady at the end of the bar, or that friendly old man who's entering your office building? In this modern world, anybody could be a hacker or cracker. The only difference is whether they plan to steal or defend your data. Please remember that what you may learn here can be used to defend yourself or to do illegal things, so please make the right decision. So we're here, let's go in. <laughs> in 1903, Neville Masklin, an inventor and magician, hacked Guillermo Marconi's supposedly secure wireless telegraphy technology by replacing the messages with insulting Morse code. Now here's David Cope from Bletchley Park to talk about the code breaking during the Second World War. I guess most people have heard of the uh, Enigma machine. What people perhaps do not realise is that the design of the Enigma machine was not secret. It was, uh, the patent was taken out in 1919 by a man called Arthur Sherbius, um, and it was designed as a secure machine for banks and businesses to communicate one with another. It was not designed specifically for the German military. But the German military uh, saw the potential of the machine. It was taken off the, the general market, they made modifications to it, they changed the wheel wiring and added the stacker board on the front and various things like that. There are a vast number of ways in which you can set up an Enigma uh, machine. One of the methods was to let the, the operator choose his own uh, message setting, his own password. Rather like you choose your own password for your PC, yeah. uh, and you're told don't choose something obvious, don't choose your name, don't choose your date of birth, we keep changing it, and how many of us uh, ignore that? Well, uh, I know uh, I do. Uh, and uh, these were only ordinary German uh, soldiers who were choosing th their own password. And so they perhaps chose something predictable, uh, perhaps their girlfriend's name or something like, like that. And uh, they were supposed to have a new message setting for every message, and they didn't change the, uh, the message uh, setting. And so um, that helps us with what we call cribs, um, which perhaps is allied slightly to, to the way that hackers um, get in today. Uh, the operator was, was asked to choose a six-letter uh, password. The first three letters were sent in what we call plain text uh, by Morse code, but anybody who could read Morse code could understand uh, what it was. So suppose uh, the operator typed in H-I-T. Uh, that would be sent in plain text so anybody could read it. And then he would set his three rotors on his uh, Enigma machine to H-I-T. And using that setting, he would uh, encipher the next three that were supposed to be secret, which would then be used as the message setting. But you don't have to be a genius, do you? I mean, if the first three were H-I-T, and he was a German, um, more than likely the next three were going to be L-E-R. That sort of crib uh, helped us enormously. And then there were other things that the Germans did that uh, helped us uh, hack in, or we talk about, about, about cribs. Weather reports, every day, um, same time, same frequency, and it always started, weather report from. Uh, so we, we were expecting a report on this frequency, we could get a, a fix on where it was coming from anyway, and so that gave us a weather report from. We knew what the first bit of the message was going to be, uh, anyway, it would be much better if they'd sent those in plain text, uh, not in, in, in cipher, uh, because, you know, what the weather was wasn't any particular uh, secret, uh, really. And then we used to do, we know about the, the, the mines that we laid in the sea, the, the floating mines. Uh, well, we used to lay minefields, and we used to lay them to precise map coordinates. And, of course, the Germans would do aerial reconnaissance, and they would send out a message, beware, new minefield at, and they'd give all the coordinates. If then uh, we suspected that a message had uh, uh, lots of numbers in it, then perhaps those were the map references of the latest uh, minefield. And so um, uh, that gave us a, a clue there, and hence um, uh, the settings for that particular day. I think the predictability of human beings, and it was uh, the human error that helped us break in the... Uh, Enigma, because it really was a fantastic number of combinations. I wouldn't say that that uh, uh, that uh, humans have changed that much. I would think they are still are pretty predictable. They're not random. 
If asked to choose something at random, they don't choose something at random. And my students often ask me, well, with the advent of computers, then, uh, are we getting more and more complex uh, ways of enciphering? And I think the answer is yes, but there's the other side to it. Because you've got the power of the computer, you can run so many more possibilities uh, through uh, per second than you could before. So, so one is keeping pace with, with the other. So I don't think the situation, even though it's moved on, I, I wouldn't have said the situation has changed that much. Really. Reading the ciphers was obviously the name of the game, but we didn't want the Germans to know that we'd read the, uh, the ciphers. Otherwise, they would have uh, changed it. And so Churchill gave strict instructions that none of the information that we gained could be acted upon unless the Germans could think that we'd come by that some other way. And so there were elaborate hoaxes about some fictitious Italian spy, and we'd send him a message saying what a fantastic job he was doing, giving him a pay rise because he was doing so well, and we hoped that the Germans would think that was uh, how they'd come by that, that, that intelligence. And slightly more um, serious, perhaps, uh, if we'd got a German uh, convoy leaving port, if we'd read the, their battle orders, we'd know where they were going. But if our bombers had arrived straight away, then again the Germans weren't silly. They'd have thought, well, well how do they know where we are? Um, perhaps they are reading our ciphers. So what we used to do, we used to send out a single-engined uh, reconnaissance plane, unarmed. Uh, he'd know where he was going. He'd go beneath the cloud cover. He would make absolutely certain he was seen. Uh, he would send out a message. The Germans probably wouldn't try and read it. They would just say, uh, action stations, uh, the British bombers will be here uh, any minute. And we hoped that uh, they thought it was because of the spotter plane that we had um, found their position, uh, not because we'd been reading their, their ciphers. And, and um, the end to that is, think about that man, single person, unarmed, in his reconnaissance plane. More than likely he got shot down, more than likely he got killed, uh, but people were prepared to do that. The bomb was used to break Enigma. Colossus uh, was not used to break Enigma. That was used to break um, Lorentz, which used teleprinter code, not, uh, not Morse code. Um, but yeah, I think they did realize the uh, importance of it, yeah. And um, uh, the Poles had started to um, uh, produce a machine, which they called the Bomber after their favorite ice cream. Uh, because perhaps the inspiration came to them in an ice cream parlor. Uh, and that was a mechanical way of, of, of trying to, to uh, break um, uh, the settings. And in deference to the Poles, we carried on calling it uh, the bomb machine. Um, uh, when you see one, it's got banks and banks of three lots of uh, rotors. Uh, so it's simulating lots and lots of Enigma machines all at once. Uh, but even with its uh, 36 um, uh, banks of uh, rotors, um, without some cribs, without some good guesses at the, at the back, uh, you know, um, nothing uh, special to report, as I mentioned earlier, or, or, or we think this is uh, a weather report, or we think this is some, some numbers. But you certainly needed some cribs uh, on top of that. And, and you needed some, some inspiration, too. Uh, people think of code breakers uh, all as mathematicians, and certainly um, uh, Turing, a brilliant uh, mathematician. Uh, but a man called Dilwyn Knox, uh, he was older than Turing. He was around during the, the First World War. Um, he was a classicist, and he'd been reading uh, ancient uh, papyri, and um, uh, bits were missing. And his skill was, uh, you know, um, guessing uh, what the missing bit would, would be. Uh, the mindset of uh, best guesses and uh, crossword and uh, chess players and things like that, I think, is... is all important. Even though uh, Hitler was convinced that the Enigma was uncrackable, he wanted a more secure machine uh, to com communicate between himself and his high command. It wasn't a portable machine like uh, the uh, Enigma. Uh, it was a much bigger uh, machine. It was. Uh, he went to the Lorentz Company, and the Lorentz Company made this uh, uh, machine, and. Uh, that worked on teleprinter code rather than uh, Morse code. So let's perhaps not get too involved uh, with that now. But the way that was broken, I think, is, is interesting. Um, uh, we, we listened out and we, we heard this teleprinter code, but it was obviously gibberish. It had been, been enciphered and nobody uh, knew exactly how until 
There was this German uh, operator, he was sending a message from Athens to Vienna, uh, several thousand characters long, because it would have been strategy, not just ordinary uh, battle mo movements. Um, uh, and uh, obviously it was with an old-fashioned typewriter, you know, with the uh, stiff keys, so he would be a bit tired, I should think, at the end. Back came Vienna, sorry Fritz, didn't get all that. Uh, would you send it again? Uh, well, you don't send secret messages twice, and you certainly don't send secret messages twice on the same setting. But Fritz was fed up. Oh, nobody knows about this machine. Anyway, let's uh, default back to the original settings and send it all again, which is exactly what he did, and he communicated that to his offer at the other end, uh, and um, uh, the sort of plain text part at the start would have, would have told us who were listening that we got a, a second message coming on the same uh, setting. If Fritz had sent the same message identically the second time, that wouldn't have helped, because we just have two identical messages. But Fritz was fed up. Um, uh, uh, so they always started uh, message Spruck number, message number. Uh, so second time, Fritz abbreviated Spruck NR. Uh, NR is the German abbreviation for number, like NO, and he kept uh, abbreviating uh, and so the second message was a few hundred characters shorter. So we'd got two messages um, sent on the same settings. In essence, they said the same thing, but one was just slightly out of sync with the other. And that's where the clever mathematics came in. Okay, so, um, I mean, I was mentioning about uh, this was a standard three-rotor machine. In fact, there were, were different variants, and there was a four-rotor machine that the, the, the German Navy used, uh, which caused us a lot of problems and, and kept us out of the Battle of Atlantic for, for about nine, nine uh, months. Uh, but again, human error crept in there. Sometimes they would send the same message encrypted on a three-rotor machine as they would on a four-rotor machine. So if we could easily, more easily crack the three-rotor machine, then that gave us the, the settings for the four-rotor machine. Um, uh, not the machine's fault, um, human error. I think if they'd stuck to uh, strict uh, procedure, it would have been far more difficult. We had a similar machine uh, called the Type X uh, machine, and as far as we know, well, the, 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 the official story is uh, that wasn't broken. Certainly some of our, our ciphers were, uh, were broken. What we think perhaps was special about Bletchley Park was uh, there was the, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, and clever civilians all working on one, one site. Certainly there were pockets of Germans working on breaking, but, but not all in one place. And we think perhaps that's where, where we were successful. I think certainly uh, the war accelerated the development of uh, uh, computing. Um, I'm not sure that the hackers accelerated the development of Perhaps they did, because we kept trying to devise a, a more secure method. Uh, but I think the one came before the other. In 1971, John T. Draper, better known as Captain Crunch, invented the blue box. This little box used tone that tricked the telephone control system into allowing free telephone calls. This no longer works, as the phone lines now use digital signals instead of tones. 18th of August 1983, the film War Games was released, causing much paranoia that crackers could launch nuclear ICBMs. This film also coined the terms firewall, war dialing and war driving. What is war dialing and war driving? War dialing, a technique of using a modem to automatically scan a list of telephone numbers to find active ones, a technique which has since died out. War driving, a common act of searching for wireless networks, preferably unsecure, by someone with a portable device. 1983, Ken Thomas describes a security exploitation that he called a Trojan horse. The hacking magazine 2600 started in 1984. The editor was known as Emmanuel Goldstein, real name Eric Corley. The magazine provides guides for hackers and phone freaks of all skill levels. The novel Neuromancer, published by William Gibson in 1985, quickly became considered cyberpunk's first step into the major leagues and was also the founder of the terms cyberspace, the matrix, simstim and ice. Another book called The Hacker's Handbook, published in 1985, provided a guide for beginners and helpful tips for the more experienced hacker or someone interested in system security. 
In 1986, the hacker known as The Mentor published a now world-famous treaty that is known as the Hacker's Manifesto. This hacking literature is not only considered the most famous of its kind, but is also constantly being used to portray the way hackers think. In 1988, DARPA founded the Computer Emergency Response Team, CERT. 1990, Australia was the first to use a remote data intercept for the purpose of getting evidence for the prosecution. In 1995, two films were released which showed that hackers are sometimes the good guys. The first was The Net, showing that the threats computers faced are not always a result of vulnerabilities. The second was simply called Hackers. The film was about a convicted hacking prodigy as he unravels the secrets behind a virus as it threatens to unleash great damage. They're also great films, so check them out. In September 2000, the hacker Jonathan James, better known as Comrade, became the first juvenile to serve a jail sentence for hacking and is acknowledged to be one of the most famous or infamous hackers of all time. And why? Well, it might have been something to do with the fact that he hacked his way into both the NASA and the Department of Defense. His hacks themselves had caused no damage. However, he had stolen classified information. On the 4th of May 2000, computer security experts and researchers woke up to find a new worm known as I Love You. This worm had been made as part of the undergraduate thesis of Onel de Guzman. It was the first major spam virus to hit the world, and within a day of its release, experts believe every Windows computer linked to the internet was infected. The first documented denial of service attack was back in 2000. Several e-commerce sites found that there were users Several e-commerce sites found that their users were unable to access their sites thanks to a 15-year-old Canadian boy who had orchestrated this attack, causing a loss of $1.7 billion. In 2002, Chris Paget wrote a paper that revealed a vulnerability in Windows machines that used their own authenticated messaging system to allow the computers to be accessed without the required login details. This left the digital world wondering if Windows could ever really be secure. Google's campaign against internet censorship in mainland China was a result of a cyber attack on Google and other US technology companies. These hacks were called Operation Aurora. In 2011, iScorp Tech's world record was broken by TigerMate, with a staggering 700,000 websites being defaced in one go. It's not just companies that get attacked. The internet itself has been attacked too, and in 2011, the internet in Palestine went offline. To combat the attack against the Palestinian telecommunications, they disconnected the country's internet from the rest of the world to allow them to fix the problems whilst maintaining a localised network. Now, sometimes you don't know where to report a massive gap in a company's coding, so what can you do? Well, the hacker group known as the Hacker Encryptors decided to post on the popular website Passbin with a full report on an SQL injection exploit for Facebook. This allowed Facebook to fix the problem as soon as they found it, and I'm sure a lot of people had fun with it before the fix. On the 7th of January 1991, the International Coalition of Hackers, which consisted of 2600, the Chaos Computer Club, the Cult of the Dead Cow, Hispershack, Loft Heavy Industries, Frack and Fullers, listed a joint statement in response to the declaration of war that Legion of the Underground aimed at the governments of Iraq and China. In this statement, the International Coalition of Hackers stated that they had agreed with the reason why LOU has caused so much uproar but did not agree with the action they had taken due to the danger it put hackers in that they could then be considered to be cyber terrorists, which meant either jail or execution. With the issue of this statement, the declaration of war was withdrawn extremely fast by LOU. 2008 saw the hacktivist group Anonymous declaring war on the Church of Scientology. This war, that is still happening today, started out with distributed denial of service attacks, then was followed by blank faxes, prank calls and so on. The purpose of these was to cause as much disruption as possible for the church. Later in the year, the tactics of Anonymous shifted form, starting more legal actions, non-violent protests and appealing to the government to investigate the church. The Church of Scientology made various reactions to the protesting, from claims that the group had been misinformed to others branding them as cyber terrorists. Sometimes hacks are more about getting people's attention than anything else. Foxconn was hacked and had had a large amount of information dumped onto the internet. On the same day, campaigners around the world demanded that the production of iPhone 5 was done in better conditions. This was no coincidence. The hacking group Swag Security claimed responsibility for the hack, forcing Foxconn to shut down the compromised service and websites until they could fix the breach. Everyone has a different opinion on hacking depending on how it has affected their lives. Let's talk to some people and see what they think. No. I 
Do you on some degree? Uh, nope. Not really, no. Not really, no. no. Uh, very literal. I know of some softwares that can cause hacking, not that I'd ever do it. Yep. Uh, people who go into your PC accounts and take away various pieces of your information to use for bad things, I would imagine. A little bit, not very much. As far as I know, it's the ones on the computer. <laughs> that most of them just do it for fun, although I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. I don't really have an opinion, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, depends. Depends what he's doing. If he's just looking for information, yeah, go for it. If he's being malicious, then obviously I'm going to have a problem with it. Backwards. I don't think. I don't think they're good. I'm right. Should be doing good. I don't. Uh, well, I don't like the idea of hackers. Like, I know I've had profiles of mine that have been hacked before on multiple websites, and it's pretty annoying. You know, because like for certain websites, you can put your personal details on there. And if somebody gets into your account, then they also have your personal details. So. Well, unfortunately, it's the world we live in that they, um, they're basically bad people anyway. But um, because of everybody's out to make a fast buck, and they just want to rip everybody. It's a rip-off world we live in. They just want to take everything for nothing. You've got some that they want it. Uh, they're just basically not nice people nowadays, I'm afraid. A necessary evil. Uh, no. I think hacking is to do with accessing systems and cracking is something to do with breaking down software. No. Not particularly, no. Isn't a cracker one of those things you get at Christmas? When I was a bit younger, a cracker was a, somebody you could have a laugh and a giggle with. Nowadays, a hacker is the person I spoke about and a cracker normally I think is the, uh, the crackheads that take this beautiful drug that they think takes up the planet Zod or wherever it is they come from. No. The world has learned to defend itself from hackers and crackers, but both hackers and crackers create programs and exploits to get inside your computer. So let's have a look at how you can defend yourself. I'm here to show you the benefits of having a good strong password on your computer. Also, I recommend going on to Google and learning how to put a password on your BIOS. It varies from machine to machine, so make sure you've got the right one. Okay, now, as you can see, I don't have the password for this machine, so what I'm going to do Going to reboot and boot up using something called OPH Crack. It's a live CD. Now this little live CD has the ability to do what's called a brute force password break. It runs through a load of possible passwords that you might be using. Simple words from a dictionary and a few other things like that. Now I'm running off the basic standard version of it, which has not been modified or anything like this. This is exactly what I downloaded from the internet and it only takes a few minutes. Now. As you can also see, I'm able to get around in the machine without too much problems, including the My Documents section. Now we've rebooted back into Windows, and you can see the password's worked. Now, it's very easy to make it harder for these people to get the passwords. Now, simple step, all you have to do is go into your account settings and change your password. Now, you change your password to something that is simple for you, means it's simple for them. So, best piece of advice is you create a password using some random capital letters, lowercase, punctuation, numbers, and you mix it all together. Now, the thing is, you've got to remember what this password is, but the more complex and the longer it is, and the more stuff that you put into it, the harder it is for them to crack it. When you look at how the modern world has been changed because of hackers, crackers, and freakers, the world would be very different without them. Whether this has been a positive impact or not is up to you. The techniques, the skills, the software and hardware has evolved into everyday life. The technology will continue to develop and hackers will continue to try and test its true capabilities. If you'd like any more information about Bletchley Park and the Computer Museum, then visit the links in the description below. We've also got links to the software that we have demonstrated in this video. But remember, if you are going to hack someone's computer, please get permission first or you will be in a lot of trouble. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that you found it informative as well as enjoyable.
no, people did send personal uh, messages and um, some very sort of um, heart-rending messages. A German soldier um, um, being sort of surrounded and he was trying to send a message to, to his family um, in plain, plain text, not cipher. And back came his control in cipher, in cipher. And there was the poor bloke. There were tanks outside and he was just wanting to get a last message off and uh, they were worried about protocol.